Uh, my name is Kevin Piper. I'm the Director of Agricultural Operations Department for the College of Agriculture, Food, and Environmental Sciences here at Cal Poly. The Agricultural Operations Department is responsible for maintaining the agricultural infrastructure associated with our farm and ranch lands. One component of our operation, as Hunter mentioned, is the production of Cal Poly compost. Uh, this operation converts approximately 7 million pounds of livestock manure and approximately 3,000 cubic yards of campus green waste uh, into about 3,500 cubic yards of finished compost annually. The Center for Sustainability and Ag Operations have been collaborating over the past five years and will continue this collaboration to improve compost production and education around compost. So that's a little bit of information about the Ag Operations Department and our composting operation and our relationship with the Center for Sustainability. Now I'd like to welcome back to the Cal Poly campus Mark Clever, a Cal Poly alum. Mark holds a bachelor's degree in agribusiness and a master's degree in agriculture. Mark has extensive experience ranging from hands-on farm work to designing of farm utility systems to project management. Today, Mark leads the Belcampo Farms team where he takes great pride in a firm commitment to employees, animals, and land and resources. Mark strives to build diversity not only among the staff but also with his, <clears throat> but what has grown on and in, excuse me, on and in the soil of the 20,000 plus acres the Belcampo Farms <clears throat> sustainable now and into the future. Please give Mark a warm welcome back to Cal Poly. We sure appreciate him taking the time to speak today. Thank you very much. Uh, it is fantastic to, to be back at Cal Poly. Thank you, Kevin and Hunter, also. Appreciate the invitation. My name is Mark Clever, and I am president of Belcampo Farms. I was literally born minutes from here at Sierra Vista Hospital, and I was raised about 30 miles north. I once knew a farmer, and about the age of six years old, that farmer changed my life. That farmer let me drive a tractor. That farmer also taught me how to work. He taught me all about work ethic. He taught me about the love for agriculture. That farmer, with barely a high school education, encouraged me to go to Cal Poly. After I received my master's degree, he was my greatest fan. That farmer was my father, and I am very blessed to have that upbringing, and I won't forget it. I want to define and look up the word resilient. Webster defines it as able to become strong, healthy, or successful again after something bad happens. Another definition is able to return to an original shape after being pulled, stretched, pressed, bent, etc. This isn't a very good picture, but this picture was taken in the late 30s. This is a picture of my grandfather on a mowing machine. And that's my father with a broken arm after trying to start a Model T Ford. These men were resilient. Something just happened prior to this time, a minor detail called the Depression. Their farming practices may not have been as resilient, but they were resilient. They were mechanics. They were businessmen. They were actually winemakers, and my mom still has the wine press in, in her barn. They did many, many, many different things. They were butchers. They processed that meat. They canned their fruit and vegetables. 
They preserve things, held them, grew them season out, you know, in the seasons that they needed to, and then they consumed it because they had to. They were resilient. And I, I think this picture right here shows something. This is taken in the Elpomar area outside of Paso Robles. Today, there is new demand. Like many of the speakers talked about earlier, people are demanding new things, and the consumers are, are speaking about it. At Belcampo, we're taking advantage of some of these new opportunities, and some of them come from the, the artisan-style type of food crafting. Some of it is actually going back many generations the way people used to do it. In San Luis Obispo, there's a huge local movement. We're hearing about it more and more and more. People are trying to take advantage of people that grow it nearby, and they're loving to say that they bought it locally. As we heard with Grimway, with us, with many people, organic is a big deal. For us, it's the number one thing. Many people want to know if we're organic. And we are certified, and that is important to know. It doesn't cost very much to be certified, so be careful of who you talk to. It really doesn't talk that much. Anybody can do it organically, but you should have a third-party audit to have that correctly stated that you are being checked and then you have the certificate to show that. Sustainable. Sustainable probably were, means different things to everybody in this single room, but people like to see that on their food packages. Humane. That is extremely important to us. And sometimes as a farmer or a rancher, we go, well, you know, I don't want somebody telling me how to raise my animals. Well, we want to raise those animals in a way that they are going to have a wonderful life, and that will actually profit us. And if we can tell the story to our consumers, that is fantastic. It's a great thing. It's a double, a double win for everybody involved. So humane is incre in increasingly important. This is an interesting movement that is just happening, paleo. My sister-in-law just competed last year in the CrossFit Games. I don't know if anybody's familiar with CrossFit. She was on Team Invictus. They won the CrossFit Games. She consumes a little bit of protein and is fantastic. These people that are following paleo line up perfectly with what we're trying to do as ranchers raising some of the products we are. So there are opportunities out there, and some of them are coming on fast. The other one is Weston A. Price. Weston A. Price was a dentist that, tried, that, that found that nutrition tied to dental health. Some people don't believe that, but if we break a bone, our bone heals. There, he believed that you could actually heal cavities or holes in your teeth by your nutritional intakes, and I do too. There are opportunities there. There's also new opportunities. People want to know their farmer. I was blessed to have a father and a grandfather that farmed. They worked extremely hard, and it was a lifestyle that they loved. Some of us have gone away from the farm, and some of us are maybe going back a few generations to where your great-grandfather farmed. But if you go back far enough, I can guarantee you that somebody in your family farmed. Now people are wanting to know their farmer. They want to have a relationship with the farmer. I have a relationship with a lot of people. Joe Morris I have a relationship with. I want to know other farmers, and I want to build relationships, and it's extremely important in our food system. Of course, the health, combating obesity. And again, these are my opinions, and this is what I believe, but I don't think the low fat, no fat, has gotten us too far. Now we consume more sugar than anything, and it has really created some major problems. And now people are starting to second guess our dietary intake, and that is creating new opportunities for people in our industry. The other thing is, is lack of availability. There are certain, certain, certain types of products that you could get locally years ago from butcher shops. 
now with the change in the food system, it's really hard to find certain things. And now when you get to the, the paleo or the Weston A. Price people, they're wanting nutrient-dense foods, or they're wanting certain ethnic groups are wanting actually skulls of animals so they can make ethnic foods that they grew up with. And that is another opportunity that is there awaiting for us. Consumers are demanding it, and they are willing to pay. Pasture meat production, what is it? For some of you in the room, you may have never seen anything like this. There's about a little over 500 head sitting on about eight acres. So 500 head of cattle on about eight football fields is the best way to put it. We are trying to use ruminants, and I'll clarify what a ruminant is. It's a four-chambered stomached animal that has the ability to convert forages to protein. We are what's called monogastrics. We have a pretty simple, sim simple stomach system that we could eat a lot of lettuce, but we would probably not be super healthy if that's all we ate was grass or lettuce all, time, all the time, to where ruminants can convert those forages into a meat product protein. We also follow along with our non-ruminants. Non-ruminants being the other monogastrics, swine and poultry. Part of it is, is for spatial requirements. We want our animals to be out on truly pastured. We just don't label our products pastured. We want them out in the pasture because that's part of our value system as a company and me personally. We are also importing nutrients onto our soil. So we get concentrated feed systems coming in from other sources. We mix it with grain, and now we're providing feed to those animals, and now they're dropping manure onto our fields. So we're actually importing product, and we're leaving it in our fields by using our, our, uh, our ruminants are leaving it from what they grow, and our non-ruminants are importing that, those nutrients. We call this planned grazing. We want to be at the right place, at the right time, for the right reason. Does this always happen? Absolutely not. It's agriculture. Do I want it to rain? Absolutely. Can I control that? Absolutely not. We use multiple species. I want you guys to picture it as a great migration going across the, the plains of Africa. We call this the predator-prey relationship of how those animals were moved. And that's the best example because that's the only thing I can think of left. The buffalo are no longer here in the United States in the volumes that they used to be. But the lion keeps those groups of animals bunched up in a tight group. That is the predator. Any outliers that lag behind, they get eaten. That's part of the whole system and how it works. We are using electric fences to imitate the lion to try to keep those animals bunched up. We're literally on this pasture for 24 hours, and then we moved another five to eight, 10 acres the next day. These are high densities. We want our animals to go in there, and actually, they're going to be trampling much of the forage. Many of us have a hard time understanding that. It's like, oh my goodness, you're wasting that forage on the ground. The way my father farmed, he needed every bit of his crop to survive. A friend of mine, and I don't know if he's in this room today, I don't see him, he actually works here at Cal Poly, his name's Aaron Lazanoff. he put it in terms like this. Think about the forage above the ground as being the cash at hand. What the animals trample and put back into the soil goes into your savings account, and what gets broke down, once it hits the ground, it starts to break down, and it feeds the the life under the soil, and we call that our interest rate. The more you can build your interest rate, the more you'll build your savings account, the more cash at hand you'll have above the surface. And that's hard for many people to understand, especially when you're just trying to survive. But if we can do, th if we can do that, you'll see major benefits that we will actually grow more forage above the surface. And then, of course, these animals are dropping manure. And it is repeating the carbon cycle because that manure is going back into the soil. And then it will come back up into the plant system. 
and we are building organic matter. By building 1% of organic matter in our soils, you can, cre you can increase your holding water, water holding capacity by three to four times. It's extremely important. At Bell Campo Farms, we sit on about 10,000 acres in Siskiyou County. That little minor detail back there is Mount Shasta. I have a better picture in some of the other pictures. It sits about 14,000 feet, and it's in, uh, in our foreground, and it's wonderful to have as a, as a backdrop. We also have another 12,000 acres south of us of what we call winter. Well, I guess you need to have a winter to have winter grazing. But anyways, we have some grazing land south of us near, near Cottonwood. It's about two and a half hours south. We use this in conjunction with our ground that we have up in Siskiyou County. So we try to seasonally take advantage of the growing seasons in the different regions. We're a little bit uh, crazy. We try to grow 13 different species of protein. I say protein just because uh, we like to say cattle to quail. I mean, uh, with, a, with a little eggs layered in, um, we raise four quadrupeds and nine different types of species of, pro, of uh, poultry. Um, pretty, pretty different type of farm that you wouldn't normally see. Our land is 100% organic, and we are also animal welfare approved. That is our humane certif certifiers. They come and check what we're doing once a year and make sure we're on task. Our production methods. We look at it as being holistic, meaning that we don't just look at our cattle operation or our swine operation or how we're irrigating and things like that. We look at the holes amongst the holes and we try to decide how is one is impacting the other. And we actually work in an ecosystem in Siskiyou County and then the farm is a bigger part of, of a bigger hole. And then, and so the point is is that we try to look at different things and how one thing can affect something else, positively or negatively, and we try to take advantage of the positive things that we do with our animals. We are pasture-based. Not everything is grass-fed and grass-finished. Like I said, the monogastrics, we can't provide all their nutritional needs just through pasture. To take a look at this picture. This is a great marketing picture. What a wonderful way to market our animals or our, our swine here in this picture. The other thing is we're trying to utilize our animals' natural attributes to our benefit. And then you say, what do you mean? I mean, we're trying to use these hogs' noses to do something good for our soil. I understand why conventional went and put animals on concrete. I understand why we put them in cages, why we did things, because it is extremely challenging doing this. But we want our chickens to use their beaks and their feet to our benefit. We want them to eat larvae of a pest that may be getting into our cattle the next time they come around to those fields. We are trying to use them to our advantage. Very system to that, similar to that, that migration of those great herd of of African animals from the giraffe doing one thing to the warthog doing something completely different. We are trying to build that with our just our few 13 species. When you think about nature, it's amazing how, they, how it all works together. But this system is not cheap. It is not cheap at all. This is a very, very expensive way to do farming. And I completely understand why agriculture has gone the direction it has. It's important to know that there are benefits to grazing. Here's some of our Wagyu Angus cross cattle. And they have a relationship with the plants that are eating and the soil. And many people don't think about that. When they take a bite of a plant and they take half of it down, the roots also prune below the ground and they leave behind organic matter. All of a sudden, when that happens, photosynthesis starts to occur if we get those animals off and allow those plants to regrow. Christine Jones, Dr. Christine Jones out of Australia, has made a comment that there's been studies that plants will recover 20% faster 
if the saliva of a ruminant animal touches that plant compared to mowing. It's pretty incredible to think about, but again, it goes back to a natural system and the way the system was designed. With the use of these animals, we are enhancing soil biological activity. We are feeding the microbes, the fungi, the bacteria by the use of these animals. And it's ex extremely important to understand it. We are trying to keep the carbon cycle moving in the right direction. We are cycling the nutrients in the right direction. The animals are putting it back and they're taking it back up in, they're putting it into their, into their meat, and then it, it, it's just, it's, it's a cycle and it seems to make sense if you think about it. Like I said, if we can build organic matter, we will improve organic water, we will, excuse me, whole, we will improve the holding capacity of our soils. The other thing is, is think about the shade that these plants are providing to that, that soil. It could be 20 degrees underneath those plants compared to if it was bare soil. My dad never wanted a single weed in his field, and he had complete bare soil. Now bare soil is my number one enemy. But my tools and my toolbox are completely different than my father's, and now I'm trying to learn some new things and understand some new things, and I am trying to be a little more resilient myself, and I want my operation to be more resilient. Diversity, diverse plants, diverse animals, diverse understory in the soil. It's all about that. There are studies showing that there, for every one, one insect predator, there are 3,500 beneficials. I want diverse plants with flowers and different things. I want to walk through my fields and have bugs and all kinds of things flying around because most likely there are more beneficial things than there are the bad things. I manage for what I want. I don't focus on what I don't want. Forage growth, just like I said, faster recovery. When we get these animals, they bite it down. We want to leave leaf blades behind so that the plants can recover faster, so photosynthesis can, can occur. And we don't want that plant to get grazed down so far that it has to go to its re root, root reserves to recover. Stronger roots, in my mind, make stronger plants, just like a foundation of a building makes improved field, and that's all improved feed. That's ultimately what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to grow feed. Beef is just a byproduct of what we're trying to do. I believe if you have healthy soil, if life is good in your soil, it will equate to healthier plants, which will go back to the animals, and then ultimately you'll have healthy meat. That can be argued, but that's just my personal opinion. But it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? How it works. It's an art and a science. Farming always is. It's a natural cycle. We're trying to en enhance pasture quality. We're making better forage utilization. We think we're getting higher animal performance. We're getting greater nutritional value out of the plants that we're growing. We're building relationships. It's pretty interesting, this one. When, when this, I don't know, 750 head of sheep go into a field, they stop looking around for the Belcampo cheeseburgers in the field. There are plants out there that taste really good to them. I like Belcampo cheeseburgers. If I had my choice and my wife wasn't around, I may eat too many Belcampo cheeseburgers. These animals have the same thing. There are plants out in the field that they enjoy to eat. What they'll do is they'll go find them if you set stock and they'll eat those and they'll leave them and they'll come back and eat them again and pretty soon that plant gets so small and then the star thistle or something you don't want in your field will come back and it will outcompete it. When these guys go into a field, they're just gonna start grazing because now they know they have 749 of their buddies around that are also wanting to eat and you stop worrying about eating the Belcampo cheeseburgers. You eat your broccoli and spinach and everything else that you don't necessarily want. We do daily moves in our growing season. Again, we don't have proof of this. 
But just think about us. When you're moving around and you're on fresh air, I, t I took my son out a few minutes ago and we ran up and down the stairs a few times. We need to get some fresh air. Well, these animals get fresh grass, fresh feed. They're not in the same conditions over and over again, and we believe that makes them happier and healthier. We are building soil, and it's amazing. It's really fun to see. Joe Morris is doing some fantastic stuff, and it's great to see. And he happens to be using some of our animals to help him out, which is fantastic also. It's all about relationships. We are conserving moisture, and that's going to become more and more and more important as we move along. It seems simple. Using the sun, we're using soil. We have to have water. Life doesn't exist without sun or water. We're growing forages. We're utilizing the animals to harvest those forages. And then we're, we're consuming the meat. Here's a picture of uh, our Marin Market and uh, a little bit about the Belcampo model. My boss is Anya Fernal. She's a visionary, the co-founder, and now the CEO of Belcampo. She started uh, the concept of having a farm, a butchery, and uh, um, what she calls a meat company. It's an old-fashioned style butcher shop with, uh, with a restaurant component. But the, the key thing to this, this model was that she knew she needed a USDA slaughter. From us, the nearest one is three hours away. The nearest reputable one is about four and a half hours away. Growers, ranchers in this area are coming up against the same thing. There are some challenges with that. We have six, six retail locations. One's in Marin, San Francisco, Palo Alto, Santa Barbara, downtown Los Angeles, and now Santa Monica. We have choice in the marketplace, and we're giving that to our customers. They can choose what they want to do. We are creating an old-fashioned style butcher shop, similar to maybe the one that my dad or my grandfather used to have a relationship with a butcher. And ultimately, we are trying to use the whole animal, and we're figuring that out, because that's what's going to make us uh, be able to utilize the whole animal and be profitable in this system, in the system that is not cheap to do. One key component is value-added products. We make uh, bone stock, and we don't have enough bones to make enough bone stock. Weston A. Price, Paleo, there are people buying bone stock, and they're drinking it like it's coffee out of some of our shops and some of our locations. It's amazing. So my point is, is always know that there are value-added products. Peel carrots, make them smaller, make them to where you can market those. It's brilliant. Think about your operations and what you can do. Here's a picture of our downtown Los Angeles meat case. Of course, branding is always important. Um, right before lunch, I figured I'd throw this in. Here's the ingredients to a chicken bon me sandwich down in Santa Barbara. I hope that makes you hungry. Notice, if somebody's walking around with that package, do you think they know where it came from? I think they do. Here's the old-fashioned style butcher. He's not very old, but uh, we're trying to, trying to make the old-fashioned style come out. He will actually cut you a pork chop to whatever thickness you would like. Another butcher in downtown uh, Los Angeles again. The, the prior one was in Santa Monica. On that back shelf there, you can see all the value-added products that we're doing. In the left-hand refrigerator is all of our soups and all of our stocks and everything that we can't put into sausage, we're making into other things. We are trying to get whole animal use out of everything. If you look at the bottom layer, you have our poultry and then there's our eggs. Those are all of our branded products that we have down below. This is not a very good picture, but I just wanted to show you the blue leather along the sides in our banquettes in San Francisco. That leather came from our hides off of our animals off of our farm. That doesn't happen very often. There aren't tanneries around anymore, unfortunately. That took us a lot to do that. This is our Santa Monica location. We do have a full cocktail service, and we are crazy enough that we are actually growing things in our greenhouse currently that go to our cocktail program. Mints and uh, other things that they make as tinctures to uh, add to it. Again, we're telling the story. I need to wrap up here really quick. So here's a picture of my family, and we talked a little bit about this. We need to inspire the next generation. I want to pass on a legacy to my children. 
I think it's extremely important. I want to teach them why we're doing what we're doing. My kids are a part of it. They actually have talked to neighbors, and now they're running their cows on neighbors, similar to the way Belcampo is doing it. It's extremely important. We need to appreciate the lifestyle. It's fantastic. Extremely hard work. There's no shortcuts, but, it, but you will actually reap the health rewards that come from it. I want to pass it on to the next generation in better condition than today. That might be hard to do. But you got to keep life in balance. That's ex extremely important, just like the way we run our farm. Nature has a great design. Follow it. Constantly learn from our successes, improve from our mistakes, and grow in our knowledge. And ultimately, you have to love it. Here's my two-year-old last year, now three-year-old. These is, uh, our little pasture pigs got out, and she's trying to figure out how to get them back in. Those are some of her cows in the background. Lastly, what can you do? I want to encourage any local, county, state, government officials, lobbyists, think about the decisions that are coming up. I don't envy you one bit. You have a lot of challenges coming up, and it's just ultimately a base around what's going on with our water. Please think about the whole thing before you make a decision, before you raise your hand to vote on anything. It could ultimately affect our food supply. And again, I, you have a hard road ahead of you. Cal Poly, I encourage administrators to remember why you are here. If it wasn't for the students at this university, none of us would be in this room today. It's professors and, and department heads, I want you to look at your, your, uh, your curriculums and your, your classes and, and maybe go out and, and see some new things going on because these students need this more than ever. I, I can't say it enough, and we need to keep the learn by doing motto going because we need the next generation to grow our food for us. And I don't care how it is done, we just need it done. Farmers and ranchers, I encourage you to open up your gates and let people in. I encourage you to, to uh, have internships like we are trying to do with some people uh, that may come join us up in Siskiyou County. It's tough, and I, I again, hang in there. It's going to get more tough as we move along. Consumers, put your money where your mouth is. Food shouldn't be cheap, in my opinion, and we have done a great job in agriculture to make it cheap. But if you want it grown organically, if you want it grown certain ways, it is not cheap. And please put your money where your mouth is and do your part, because that's what's going to make this system become resilient in the future. Thank you. We get pretty excited over rainbow in our area. I went over. Um, do you have a couple of questions? On, on this date right now, I have willows and all kinds of trees and animals in my creek, and I have a pond in my creek. 1990 was a drought. I bought the farm. I let things come back, and we have water in my creek. Have you ever heard of that before? We need our trees. Any comments? Overgrazing, and I'm not talking about overgrazing in these pictures. I'm trying to uh, relay a picture that animal impact can bring back vegetation in riparian areas. 
where the problem occurs is having animals too long in the one place at, at, for long durations of time. And that's what overgrazing is. Overgrazing isn't because of the animal, it's because of the impact it has on a single plant. And then when you do it over a whole vast area, we're actually trying to encourage uh, agencies who want to exclude rivers from grazing that, um, where were the buffalo ever excluded from grazing? They didn't, we didn't have fences on the Missouri River or Great Rivers. Those buffalo had to follow the feed. But look at the great prairies that we used to have. Those animals had great impact. Sometimes rest is important, but too much rest is not good as well. Um, my children, I'm trying to teach my children about the impact that when a, when a plant is grazed, that it will actually regrow and it will take up nutrients and it will keep the nutrient cycle glowing. A, a chemically oxidizing plant that is not growing is not taking up the same nutrients as a, 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 a growing green plant. Any other questions? I'd like my son to stand up. He's been enduring this. Uh, I don't know if he's going to be a farmer or a rancher or not, but I'm giving him an opportunity to be able to make that choice on his own. And I think things like this are important for an eight-year-old boy to, to have a little bit of understanding of. It's hard for him to sit in this room, so thank you for your patience of letting him. That was a multiple uh, stage question there. Um, um, is it financially viable to do what we're doing and can we do enough of it? Is that more or less what you're asking? Um, well, what we're finding is, and it, it, it isn't something that just happens overnight. And um, for us to do it at the scale that we're doing it, I don't know long term if we're gonna we're gonna honestly make it we're trying our darndest um, I think that a similar model to what we're doing is financially viable whether or not for us it is time will tell um, I think we're seeing that the use and I believe in the use of animal impact in a positive way I think by the use of the positive impact we are actually increasing the yields in our fields we are making the systems that some of the other people are talking about and how it's working. And we are seeing positive results. Can I feed America this way? Can I feed the world this way? I don't know. But I think locally, people can do some amazing stuff. Feeding downtown Los Angeles with local farmers, I don't know if that's able to do that but I can feed much of my community this way and I think San Luis Obispo is showing some things on a local food movement right now in my opinion agriculture isn't feeding the world because there are still starving people in the world we are trying but we're not completely doing it even in the system that we're in I don't know if we can do it or not so I didn't answer your question I'm sorry <laughs> question with from Gerald yeah So there's, there's an issue on the, the, the relative lack of slaughterhouses and the ability to get uh, meat processed, yeah? So for us, um, and again, um, we are extremely blessed to be able to set up a system like this. Not everybody can do this. You can't be completely vertically integrated like we are. Um, so I completely understand that. But for us in this model to even begin to even possibly make it we knew that we had to have the USDA slaughter as a component up and down this state and probably across this country there were butcher shops in my hometown there was Brian's beef right along the Salinas River for years and years and years there was many slaughterhouses that were USDA and then as our food system changed 
those two went away along with the, the uh, tanneries and uh, the other places. For us to travel three and a half hours or four and a half hours or on up into Oregon five hours to have a USDA kill, that wasn't going to work in our system. Plus, we have specific ways that we want to cut that beef. We have specific things that we want to do with our value-added products. So the component for the USDA had to be there. So we chose to build it 20 minutes from our farm, and our community was excited. I did the groundbreaking ceremony, and I was concerned that people were going to be upset. People were applauding and excited just because we provided, at that time, five to 10 jobs. And in Siskiyou County, that was a big deal. Now we provide on the farm close to 30 jobs and at uh, the slaughterhouse about 30 jobs. There's only about 12,000 working people in Siskiyou County, so that's pretty amazing. And it's fun to, fun to say that uh, um, it was a positive thing to put a, a slaughterhouse in our community. Well, or encourage people that have uh, the USDA possibility, and this university has that possibility, and I know there's been some challenges with that, but I think we're going to make some, some advancements to maybe provide an opportunity for local growers in this area. We just had a little forum yesterday talking about this very thing, and I think there is some opportunity. But if you have the capital, yes, but most people don't have the capital. And if you try to do it a co-op, I think that's going to be extremely challenging either. I don't have that answer. I'm just saying for our system, that's what we had to do, and we had the luxury to do it. Yes? Absolutely. So what's that? Oh. Have we made the, our slaughter facility available to other ranchers? Absolutely. We don't do poultry, but we do all the other quadrupeds. And what we do is we, since we own it, we get to be first in line. So everybody gets to be in line behind us. So currently we're taking about 12 head of beef a week of our own farm. And then we are integrating custom harvest and processing for other growers. And some people are traveling distances of three to four hours like we would have. But they like what we have to offer them. They like the value-added products. They like to be able to have that. And um, we, we are fitting a niche in that area as well. And it's fantastic because we're getting maximum use out of our employees. Instead of having highs and lows, we're evening that out. And it makes a lot of sense. Okay, I think we're out of time, but Mark, thank you so much for being with us. That was a great presentation.